Uh, welcome everyone to Moonshots 3, Fixing the Future. Tonight we're going to talk about some of the uh, future tech that's going to help us face some of our biggest social and economic challenges. So to open, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and extend my respect to Gadigal elders past and present. The First Nations voice to Parliament has been in the news for a while, speaking of um, political current issues. So the voice to Parliament must be the most palatable of the three recommendations that came out of the Uluru Gathering, which is two years ago now. The other two recommendations were a treaty and a truth-telling commission. Treaty was talked about briefly, and the Science Party has a policy of um, negotiating and enacting a treaty with uh, the First Nations people of this continent. But truth-telling got no airtime at all, perhaps because it would be too much work for the government, even though it sounds easy. The effect of erasing First Nations history and culture has also set back the global scientific community. Um, the false portrayal of Aboriginal groups as being exclusively nomadic hunter-gatherer people has enabled the myth of terra nullius, but it also has led to denial about how this continent needs to be managed. Um, those practices are slowly being recognised from ancient fish traps around, the country, uh, around much of the continent to hazard reduction burns, they're now pretty mainstream I think, to knowledge of binary stars and medicinal compounds that warrant further research. Tonight's talks uh, might focus on the background and the benefits of particular technologies, but I think it's also important to put progress in context. The Science Party's vision is <laughs> not just that new technologies are discovered and developed, but that everyone is able to benefit from them, not just the wealthy and not just city dwellers. So that's what our vision is all about. So our talks tonight are going to be about nuclear fusion, extending our healthy lifespan, space ex exploration, and food security. Um, each of our speakers will speak for about 10 minutes and we'll then have some time for questions. And I ask that you keep your questions very to the point. Um, and it's actually a question. So, um, to lead us into uh, tonight, I'd like to quote um, Kenneth Bowles, who says, if fatal is uh, to do with um, how we look to the future when it comes to our uh, emerging technology. And uh, the idea that it's, it's very easy to think that everything is getting worse because we know, um, we know so much more now about what's going on in the world. We know more good things, but we know more bad things that are going on. Um, but uh, Kenneth says, if fatalism is the disease, hope is the vaccine. We urgently need positive visions of the future to counter these seductive dystopias. We need meaningful, realistic, flawed yet compelling visions that inspire people to move through grief and into action. I think that's pretty relevant to the, uh, the task we have ahead of us when it comes to climate change, but I think it applies to a lot of other areas as well. So let's get on to our first talk. Our first speaker is Joe Patchan. Joe has been at Sydney University since 1992 and is now an associate professor in plasma physics. Joe also has an interest in physics education and how students learn. Um, his plasma physics work includes uh, spacecraft propulsion, but tonight he will give us a rundown on the state of nuclear fusion. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, I'm Joe uh, from Sydney Uni, and I, I assume here that everyone is familiar with fusion energy, or have you heard of fusion energy? I'll be for the day. Look, I'll give a brief introduction as to, um, by the way, it works. The sun works, okay? Mm -hmm. That means physically it's possible. So, so what I'll tell you about is just give a very brief introduction to fusion energy. What's the state of the art? What's happening now? Uh, what's the time scale for a power station? And, um, and there are people that are impatient, and so they're seeking alternative um, methods. And what is Australia's involvement in it? And you might think it, it doesn't have any. It does. All right, so just a brief thing. I stole this off the web, and I failed because I don't reference what website I got this from. So mark me down for that. I'll use marks for that. Um, uh, fusion is where I take light particles 
in this case, we have uh, protons. And this is what happens in the sun. You start with hydrogen, basically hydrogen nuclei, and they collide. And if there's enough pressure and temperature, uh, they will fuse, they will collide, they will coalesce into larger uh, nuclei, and so on. And they'll keep going until they get to iron. <laughs> when they get to iron, because if I say iron, as we say in Australia, then you don't know if I'm saying iron as in charged particle or iron as in iron. Okay. So when they get to iron, they will stop. Um, and then the rest of the elements are made in supernova. So um, here's an interesting graph. The y-axis is, um, the, the x-axis is the atomic mass number. So you can see you start from one for hydrogen and work your way up. On the y-axis is the average mass per nucleon. Ab so as you coalesce nuclei into heavier and heavier uh, nuclei, the mass per nuclear particle, per proton, per neutron, starts to decrease. What you think is the mass of a proton loses mass as the nucleus gets heavier and heavier. And you might say, where does that mass go? Well, every time you get a fusion event, it goes as energy, according to that, we shall not mention that equation. It has an E and an M and a C and a squared. So, <laughs> so the C squared, the C is such an enormous number, the speed of light, that a tiny bit of energy, a tiny bit of mass, produces a huge amount of energy, and that's the attraction uh, for fusion. The other attraction is, it's like nuclei, hydrogen, hydrogen isotopes, uh, boron, you can do it with boron, um, you can do it with real, a lot of light elements, and they'll produce energy. And it is abundant. Light elements are abundant in the universe. You will not run out. Uh, so that's the attraction. So uh, that's my brief introduction to what fusion is. Now I've got to get some terminology going. So in generally, we can easily make fusion. It's Mark Oliphant did it a century ago. On a bench top, you can fuse two nuclei, and they will do it. They just don't do it frequently enough for you to get an energy uh, more energy out than you put in. So in fusion, we talk about energy gain. That is, the energy we put in, else, and related to the energy we put out. So we, we define a factor Q, the energy gain, of energy out from, from the fusion events divided by the energy we put in. That's the Q factor. And we would like it to be more than one. We'd like it to be as much as, as high as possible. So how do we do it? Uh, here is one method that has been successful. What you see there is a whole bunch of electromagnets, if you've ever made these at school. Wind a wire in a circle, pass a cart through it, becomes a magnet. <clears throat> if, <clears throat> if you put them in such an arrangement where they form a torus, the great thing about a torus is it has no beginning and no end. It's a continuous space. So what is special about that? Electrically charged particles, such as nuclei, will circulate around a magnetic field, and they will follow it. And, they, and, and in principle, they should follow it forever. In practice, they don't. <clears throat> and if you trap particles using these toroidal magnetic fields, and you heat them a lot, <laughs> millions of degrees, hundreds of millions of degrees, you can contain them in magnetic fields without them striking the sides of a, of a physical vessel. And when you heat them to that temperature, they will start to come close. They will collide with each other. But most of the time, they're just bouncing off each other. That's the most likely event. They repel each other. One, a probability of 1 in 10 to the 8. <laughs> really tiny probability. You get a fusion event. So you have to contain these particles for long enough in order for you to get a reasonable amount of fusion. And so uh, this device, this toroidal device, is known as a tokamak. It's a Russian invention. This is the inside of one. This is called the joint European torus. On the left is when, the, when it is not turned on. On the right is when you introduce gas, deuterium or hydrogen, and you ionize it. You see the glow on the edge. You don't see much of a glow in the center. There is a bit of a glow. Uh, that's because in the center, it's hot. On the edge, it's cooler. 
it's funny, you will see the cool, this is called a plasma, when you ionize the gas, you will see the cool plasma, you will not see the hot plasma, because when electrons and ion and nuclei are ripped from each other, the only way you could see them is they can recombine and emit light. I mean, you, you don't want them to do that, you want them to stay hot. So when a plasma is very hot, fusion hot, you will not see it. It will be invisible in the visible range, but in the X-ray range you can see it. Okay. What has been the progress? What's this old, what is this old chestnut about fusion being 50 <laughs> years away? What's going on? Look, um, part of it is, part of it, it's, it's done today in all sorts of fields. When are we going to have a quantum computer? Oh, it's just around the corner. It's hype, right? There is hype that goes with science. I try not to practice it. There are those who do for various reasons. Hype. And, and you might say, well, you need hype to publicize science. I won't, wouldn't argue with you. Some of us just don't do it, but some of us do. So hype has always existed. We're just going to have, we're just going to have fusion, just, just in 20 years' time. Go, just, just give us money. So um, if you put that aside, what has been happening apart from this hype? The fact is, progress has been happening since the 1950s, well, when it was all declassified, really since the 1960s. It's all been happening. So let me point out what's happening with this graph. Sorry, I forgot to start my, uh, my stopwatch, so I'm, I, please indicate when I've got. Uh, so on the x-axis, I want, uh, is a figure of merit. What is that? It's the pressure of the plasma times the con energy confinement time, how long you can keep the energy there. On the y-axis, on the x-axis, is the uh, temperature. Now, what's significant about this plot? You need a combination of these two parameters for you to say when you're going to get an, a power reactor. This, this uh, slightly uh, faded orange region is the uh, a break even, the Q equals 1, energy out equals energy in. And this red region is your power station where the, it's just you don't supply any more power. The plasma feeds its own power and keeps going. So what are these stars and, and, and squares and so on? Uh, they are a few. There's been about a hundred fusion reactors made, a lot of them. So obviously I don't have all these points on me. But these are some of the, the more successful ones. Each one of these symbols is a different uh, tokamak or Mostly they're tokamaks, 90, 95% they're tokamaks. And you'll see in 1968, that combination of the temperature and the, and the product of uh, uh, pressure and, and confinement time is quite low. It's nowhere near the region you need to be. 1980, you're somewhere here. In the 1990s, there they are. In the 1990s, they're in the break region. Re they're in the break even region. So they're there. They have been making steady progress all this time. And it's been a hard slog, because these machines are large, they're expensive, things are slow. That's, that's the problem. But they got there, and they got there uh, in various machines, all designed on basic principles that they've learned throughout all five decades, or four decades. In that For that reason, they said, we can now make, we think we know how to make a, a power station type reactor. And the reactor is now called ITER. So ITER is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor. It's uh, designed, by the way, he's a standard six foot person, right there. Um, it's designed. How many meters? Sorry? How many meters? Uh, in, in, in width? Six foot. Oh, six foot. Six foot. Uh, what's six foot in? in 1.8. In, 1.8. All right. It's a 1.8 meter man. Uh, right there. It doesn't matter. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure if I just... Uh, it doesn't matter. So, so it's designed for a, uh, uh, an energy gain of 10 uh, using deuterium and tritium, both are isotopes of hydrogen, and it's supposed to put out 500 megawatts of power, and its construction is 50% complete. It's situated in the south of France. Here's one of its magnetic field coils. There's about... Ooh, I think there's 18 magnetic field coils. You can see how large they are. There's 40 people there. Uh, so it's a, and moreover, it's a superconducting coil. If you've ever tried to muck around with superconductors, you, things have to get really cold. Okay, 
So what's the progress? There was a lot of politics, a lot of delays, Americans came in, Americans went out, a lot. Anyway, things have settled now. Politics has been set aside. The first plasma, not a fusion plasma, you might put in hydrogen, which on Earth is not likely to give you fusion, is 2025. That's five years from now. They'll turn it on. They, this is taken from a recent paper, 2019, from the director of that facility. In five years' time, they're going to turn it on to show, to show the work. Then there's various stages where they have to upgrade it. 2035 is fusion operation. That means deuterium tritium to produce fusion with an energy gain of 10. So that's roughly 15 years from now. So if you want to time scale, we're looking at 15 years. It's, it's, not, it's becoming less now. It's no longer 50. <laughs> so here's, uh, the place where it's situated in France is called Cadarache. It's in the south of France, Provence region. Uh, there are seven partners. <clears throat> I'll let you guess the flags. Uh, <clears throat> um, so I, I won't take up too much time. There's seven uh, major partners. <clears throat> so what are people doing? They don't like the slow time scale. For me, 15 years is not too bad. They don't like the slow time scale. So what they do is uh, they, there's about 17 startup companies, uh, small fusion companies with alternative concepts. <clears throat> Some of them are tokamaks, but they're using a new type of superconductor um, that can generate much higher magnetic fields. And when you generate high magnetic fields, you can shrink the tokamak to smaller than this room. So that's the current state of the art. They are, I've, I've mentioned two very promising companies. They're ones to watch. Will they beat ETA? We don't know. What's Australia's involvement? Uh, look, I've, I've said there's two universities. There's probably pockets in some other universities, but I don't hear from them too often. There's the ANU and Sydney University. The ANU really has been the major contributor. It develops diagnostics for ITER. Uh, they do mathematical modelling. They study plasma surface interactions. All very important for ITER. And uh, at Sydney University, we don't do things directly for ITER. We study. We study another form of fusion. Uh, it's fusion, but rather than magnetic confinement, you can actually confine things with electric fields. And when you can do that, they work on a on a tabletop rather than needing a large uh, needing a large uh, uh, structure. So, um, what is Australia's involvement in ITER? Well, it, we've had success. So you cannot access ITER uh, data or IP, or anything like that, if you're not a partner. Being a partner means you've got to have financial contribution. <clears throat> through, our, through ANSTO, Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization, we, are now, we now are the first non-member country to have a, an, um, um, a, a, an agreement of, uh, of technical cooperation, which means we can go there, we can access data, and we will contribute to ETA in some way, put diagnostics or whatever. So we have a direct involvement in ETA on the cheap. We're not paying for what the partners do. <clears throat> so we are involved in ETA research right here. So that's basically it. I'm sorry if I've used more than my allocated time. I didn't ever turn on my stuff. Okay. So um, 9 to 5, uh, Professor Peter is, uh, advises uh, on investments in future tech. He's also uh, founder of Transhumanism Australia. So their goal is to escape the meat cage that we call our bodies. And a large part of that is extending the length of our healthy lifespan. So please welcome Peter Zink to talk about Thank you. That was really good. I'm a little excited about Moonshot 3 because we're hearing about all the emerging technology. It all converges in what Transhumanism Australia is all about. Um, you know, here we're talking about extending our health span, and uh, I guess uh, one of the first things that uh, really came to me was, well, you know, there's 120,000 Australians that actually are dying every year, right? You know, that's like a, a Qantas 747 crashing to the ground every single day. You know, typically about 400 people. And you know, if if I told you if that was a disease that was killing everyone uh, around the world, it'd be 100,000 people a, a day. Um, you'd be 
pretty pretty mortified, right? We'd be like, why, why are we putting a stop to this thing? And um, you know, this is essentially happening all around us. But the numbers is this is actually caused by the aging process itself. So the aging it causes up to two thirds of all deaths all around the world. Um, age related diseases like cardiovascular disease, disease, you know, lung disease, heart cancer. These are all a result of our bodies essentially shutting down due to the aging process. Um, one of the challenges that people you know, think about aging as a disease is that, well, the narrative of aging, you know, you're born, you grow up, you know, to have some kids, uh, we get married before that, but you know, then you just grow old and pass away. So that's, you know, you're told that story and you sort of live it. You know, people hear you know, the, the narrative of you're going to live every day to its fullest because you don't know if it's your last, right? So that's just embedded in society. And we have that defeatist approach to, to what it is to, you know, continue to age and they expect to die, you know, if you live a good innings uh, up to 80 or so, right? that's what expected today. Um, and if you look throughout history, that, that innings, a good innings has extended longer and longer. You know, we talk about medieval days, if you're thir your 30s, you're in your senior years and, uh, you know, now we're expecting 80 in Australia and that's increasing every time. And I guess when we go back to physics, you know, we heard earlier how you know, the proton is smashing in and creating you know, essentially fusion energy. But if you look at the cells within our bodies all the way down to the particle level that are you know, going up, you know, the particles create the atoms, the atoms create the molecules, molecules create the cells, and stem cells are the fundamental building blocks of what it is to be alive, right? All the cells in our bodies. Um, and there's 3 million, 300 million of these cells that are essentially you know, replicated every single minute. So, you know, what, what it is, to, you, you heard the term that you're essentially a new person every seven years it's because your cells so essentially replicated and die away. Um, 300 million cells a minute. Um, and that's that replication process, right? Everything is really just a copy of a copy of a copy. So if you think about a, a photocopying machine, eventually you're taking that same copy and make a copy of that copy, eventually things just lose fidelity. So these are the errors that build up due to the aging process. Um, you know, essentially what you're saying that uh, the causes of death, I mentioned what it is in our golden years, you know, we've got cardiovascular disease, cancers, dementia, respiratory diseases, these all happen, you know, the most commonly cause of death once you're 70 and beyond in Australia. And so what are they doing? They're currently doing research that are groundbreaking um, in terms of experimenting on mice. You know, we're uh, looking at these uh, cells called senescent cells. These are the cells that become zombie cells in our bodies. Um, after a few replication errors, uh, they essentially start causing damage to the cells around you, uh, around that particular senescent cell, and eventually um, that essentially causes that, that aging process. Um, so researchers have actually tried to you know, genetically energy in mice to make it easier to remove these senescent cells, and they've seen a 30 to 40 percent increase in the healthy lifespan of mice. So translate that to humans, that's a, you know, that's a another 40 years, you know, good, good healthy life, right? So, <laughs> Um, you know, mice share a lot of genetic traits as humans, so they're actually doing human trials right now. Uh, NAD plus is a, another thing they're looking at. It's a coenzyme. Essentially, it's a, it helps the, um, if you think about the printing machine, you know, it's simply helping fix up that printer to make sure that uh, you're making that better copy each time. You're not causing as much error. And this is what's in our bodies. Um, lower NAD plus levels uh, you're seeing as, as people get older, and that's actually causing more and more damage cells. So uh, they've actually done experiments more on mice to actually uh, boost these NAD plus levels. Um, one of the drugs uh, they're taking a precursor is called NMN. Uh, um, essentially that's uh, one of the things that UNSW and Harvard Medical School is looking at. Boosting these levels, uh, essentially increasing healthy life of mice as well. And then there's metformin, the stuff that diabetics takes, and um, that's boosting 30% of healthy lifespan of mice. Rapamycin, there's a whole raft of things that have been currently experimented and trialed on humans. Um, and it's actually showing promising results. And then we haven't even got to things like stem cell therapy that's available now, and essentially regrowing those parts of the bodies. And there's gene therapy to extend things like the telomeres. These essentially, they're the ends of our DNA strands that uh, making sure that, uh, that they stay longer, um, to make sure that uh, as we age, these continue to create the same cells uh, on the duplication process. Um, yeah, so this, uh, uh, David Sinclair and Dr. Lindsay Wu, so they'll be actually presenting at the Singularity Summit in October, uh, talking about their latest research and the human trials they're having using the NMN drug we talked about earlier. And so this is very local, 
uh, these guys are actually, their day jobs is trying to extend healthy human lifespan. And uh, they're getting more and more press, but a lot of people actually don't realize that this is happening. That there's a possibility that there could be one day a, a pill that you could take that could actually continue to get, get you healthier for longer. Um, you know, there's this breakthrough with more and more. Who's funding the research? Uh, UNSW. Uh, and Australian government uh, could join it. Um, and Harvard as well in the US. Um, there's a whole Rutgers Salt Institute, there's a whole sort of different initiatives taken on by universities and research houses. And it's actually going into the investment companies too. Oh no, because normally there'd be like a pharmaceutical company sort of saying, because mm -hmm. they want to get the patent for it and make yeah. themselves rich. Yeah, GSC. But this exists yeah. without patent, is it? Uh, no, yeah, some of them are patented, so they do collaborations with um, you know, GSK and a few others. But, um, uh, are one you of the working ones that, with this project? Uh, it's on the Google ones, yeah. <laughs> it's cool. well, I'll, show you, I'll show you in a sec the slide. Oh, no, because it's happened time and time again. Australia's done the research. We've got questions at the end. The questions at the end. Sorry. The questions at the end. Oh, sorry. That's right. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I just wanted to just pass it. We'll get through it. Uh, I'll show you that slide as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, more and more breakthroughs every single day, right? So these, you know, this is um, from the University of Cambridge, and uh, they essentially reversed uh, the aging process in the rat brain with these stem cells. So, um, you know, translate that to oh, healthier yeah. mental health and things. Yeah, it's actually working out. Um, then there's, you know, all these parts that we can grow in, in animals, right? So Peppa Pig provides, they're made to order, hearts, livers, kidneys, and lungs, these are all happening. And you, know, you probably heard from a colleague or, or someone that you know of, that's actually, you know, if they're, if they're more senior, they're looking to get a transplant, and one day they'll actually be done uh, growing out of pigs, uh, genetically engineered pigs that uh, have the compatibility of humans. And um, this is like 3D printing as well, uh, 3D bioprinting, a company uh, by the name of Inventia Life Science. They created a rastrum printer that will also be at the summit. Essentially, it's uh, 3D printing these tumor cells to actually help researchers do uh, cancer research. So, you know, if you just do it a Petri dish on a 2D uh, Petri dish, you would have the same simulating effects as you would if you had a 3D printed tumor. Try to simulate what it's like in a human body. Um, so all these breakthroughs are happening. And there's regular bionics, you know, just replacing parts uh, with, with uh, machine cyborgs are real. They're out there. And, um, you know, also, yeah, to your question earlier, these are the other sort of investment houses investing in it. So Google, Alphabet, they've got Verily, you've got Calico. Um, Unity Biotech is a listed company in the US. Uh, Cobar is one of the companies, Harvard Medical School. Um, and then there's the research foundation, Sense, that they're doing a lot of these, you know, invested by the billionaires like Peter Thiel and a whole bunch of crypto guys are the towel and butter in. So <laughs> there's a whole raft of research. So it's full of frantic. Yeah. <laughs> Eventually it'll be for a billionaire, right? That's the thing. Um, and then there's CRISPR gene editing. So, philanthropic. That's it. So you got uh, gene editing, the cut and paste tools of DNA. So uh, there's also companies that are listed on the, uh, on the NASDAQ. You know, Editas, CRISPR Therapeutics, Interalia. These are actually companies that are applying CRISPR technologies today to solve things like HIV and cancer. Um, and there's Illumina, Illumina that does the whole genome sequencing because the cost of sequencing a human essentially dropped from hundreds of millions of dollars of 10 years ago uh, to only a few cents. Um, then there's design babies. We talked about choosing your sex uh, of the babies. Well, you know, if they don't stop there, you can also choose the, the eye color, the intelligence potentially as well. So they're also identifying all these genes that uh, indicate different traits in humans, such as intelligence. Um, and, and you know, uh, length and tallness and things like that. So Chinese guys actually uh, created a, a designer baby. So there's twins out there who the same. Um, AI research as well in healthcare, um, just applying drug discovery, applying AI for medical diagnosis. So all these convergent technologies will uh, look to actually help you live longer and healthier. Um, and we haven't even got to things like um, what the tech companies are doing around quantified health and improving your mental health. The same neural link we talked about in you know, Elon Musk's uh, a company that does brain computer interfaces. So, if you're having mental health problems, these are the first things that they'll be targeting to, to uh, actually try to cure. And so, Apple essentially might be one of the health insurance companies that will help you stay fit um, using that more technology to integrate with your body, you know, just like what they've done with Copley. Um, yeah, so I guess the narrative you know, we're talking about health span versus lifespan, trying to increase the performance of your healthy body all the way up to, you know, at, at to a certain point, you know, we don't, we're not saying that uh, you could live indefinitely because, you know, there's still dangerous things out there, like, you know, buses might get hit by one of those, driverless vehicles will just try to help that, but, uh, you know, you just want to prevent this continuous decline until your body can end up with it, which is sort of limit that you currently have around 120. 
Uh, and there is a you know community building up. So uh, longevity X Prize is out there. We're actually trying to get a million dollars given to an organisation that can convince the government to put you know treat aging as a disease in their policies. So um, fancy that. Well, this is uh, Voltan and the guy in the US. But look at the science party. We've got the uh, the aging as a disease policy number two in the health policy. So we get this into parliament. One of the governments to adopt it. Gotta get that prize, huh? Get that bag. Secure the bag. And so, uh, yeah, pros and cons of living longer and healthier. I'm sure you guys can think of all the sci-fi, you know, futuristic implications of people living indefinitely longer forever. Um, you know, but one of the positive things I think will maybe climate change will become something that is accepted by generations that uh, might have a future continuously. Uh, but also, you know, think about all your loved ones. You know, if they can also have the benefit of living healthy and longer. Uh, this essentially means that you have more time to do what you love, what you're passionate about, multiple careers, and secure the nuclear fusion and things like that in the future, right? As well. um, but uh, the downside, you know, we talk about aging population, um, you know, if it's, everyone's not going to die, well, what's going on? We're going to have you know, scarcity around the world. Um, one of the things that uh, people say, well, um, that's, uh, it's a linear problem because it's going to get solved one day at a time. Uh, it's not like something like a baby boom. But like a geometric problem in an accidental thing. So we have time to try to fix space and an aging population like we're currently facing. Um, so let's use technology to create abundance. You know, let's uh, look at that to make more use of the things we have more efficiently. And then we can also look out to the stars and you know, become multi-planetary and things like that. So giving us more time to actually create that abundance mindset. Um, yeah, so those are some of the thoughts on a healthy smart span. But uh, any other questions? Any questions? Uh, Taha Khan. Taha is a, a member of our policy team and has um, uh, done a lot of the work to write a couple of submissions uh, to the Australian Space Agency. Uh, he's a finance lawyer during the day but has a special interest in um, the space industry and is very well placed to now speak to us about space exploration and what Australia is up to. Thank you, Taha. Thank you. So I didn't prepare any slides, I thought I'd just talk to everyone. So, uh, just by way of background, about seven years ago, I wrote an honours thesis on international space law, trying to define the difference between outer space and aerospace using Virgin Galactic's Light Night Space Program. Because we have suborbital tourists who might be subject to different carrier regimes and then space law at the same time. So that's sort of how I got interested. Um, it's been a good journey, I've been following it since. Um, it's sort of been on hiatus for a couple of years and then with the launch of the new space agency and new regulations coming out, I've sort of dove back in and been helping the science party rewrite some of its policy, which is still under construction. Uh, on the back of that, we've made some submissions. Um, the first one, consulting on the high-powered space regulations for rockets. Uh, in that, we've sort of said, look, you need to simplify the permit regime, you need to get rid of duplication, you need to take only information from applicant organisations that really is necessary for national security and not pass that on to foreign powers, which was in the proposal. Uh, interesting. Um, on top of that, the way you define a rocket, they had chemical propulsion. I think that's sort of out of whack with international norms and Australian historic approaches, which is to look at purpose and look at whether or not you have a degree of control on descent and uplift. And that was the basis of the first submission. The second was on the design for the International Space Investment Initiative. So we made a submission on how that program works, how the funding should work. We thought there should be at least quarterly or twice yearly funding rounds. We thought the criteria should be abundantly clear and quite certain. Um, remains to be seen where that goes. Uh, we also recommended that the Australian Space Agency partner with more regional counterparts rather than looking to the traditional allies of the US, the USA and JAXA, mainly because there are a lot of uh, shared interests across the region. Um, Australia's strengths are in remote sensing, ground-based operations, and it would make sense to partner with those. Uh, so going forwards, the Space Agency has it's a year old, signed a number of memorandums of understanding with a number of space agencies across the world, some statements of strategic intent. Not too much else has come out just yet, it's early days, they have a 10-year strategy, 
Uh, the idea is to turn the current four billion market into a twelve billion domestic market, and they want to contribute another twenty thousand jobs to bring the local industry to thirty thousand people. Um, off the back of that, they've got nineteen and a half billion that they're investing in local space infrastructure, two million to Western Sydney's Aerotropolis for advanced manufacturing, six million in Adelaide for the Discovery Centre. Uh, in addition, there is a space infrastructure fund. 15 million uh, to potential international participants to work with local players. Uh, the overarching theme, our agency is not going to take the lead. Instead, they're going to usher in and facilitate the partnerships with local players in the private sector to then contribute internationally. And that's the direction we're going. Huh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, look, that's just the current. No, current I think mean, that's cool. That sort of speaks to the, the lack of Australia's involvement in space. I'm sort of running a bit over time, so that's great. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the evening food security in the era of climate change. And I have to thank uh, Paul Malloy, who is one of our members from Queensland and is a research fellow in this field at the University of Southern Queensland. So uh, a lot of this content is from Paul, but I am presenting it for ease tonight. Um, and can I just ask James to see if he can get a hold of Paul, because he'll be well placed to answer any questions um, at the end of this. So let's get to this. So um, yeah, so when we talk about food security, uh, food security, um, this is the definition we still use today from the 1996 World Food Summit. Food security exists when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So I'll talk about food insecurity globally and in Australia, then look at the ways that good policy and good science can maximise food security. So I'll just jump in with a recent example when food security was threatened across the world. I could have shown photos of food riots, but that felt a bit exploitative, so I've got a graph. In 2008, global cereal crop prices spiked. Um, this is really just important to see the massive increase in 2008 of rice prices, which literally quadrupled briefly and then fell back to double their regular price for an extended time. Cyclone Nargis hit Myanmar's rice growing regions. There were worldwide shortages and a panic cycle of stocking up and tariffs and import-export restrictions. Um, rising oil prices at the time also, James is going to love this, encouraged the use of maize for bioethanol production to reduce dependence on uh, fossil fuels at the expense of food crops. So the effects, of course, were felt by mostly poorer countries where food prices soared and riots in Haiti overthrew the government. So this was a wake-up call for governments around the world to ensure food security for their people. Australia is a major food producer, so we need to consider that food security for us is also crucial to national security. Our trading partners depend on food imports from us. And in the case of another episode like the 2008 one, we could continue to feed ourselves by reducing our exports, but that would contribute to unrest in our trading partners and uh, could affect our imports as well. Uh, we say the world, oh yeah, sorry, we did mention that. So um, we've, we've traded subsistence farming for the efficiency and comforts of specialisation and urban living. So there's a risk there, right, that if food stops coming in from the farms to the city, we don't eat. But we can manage that risk. I think uh, the benefits of specialisation are, uh, you know, they're worth it. They're, that's what drives technological process. Most Australians would have barely noticed those 2008 price spikes, but ongoing food insecurity does affect 5% of Australians, with the risk being much higher in some groups. And there's a lot of crossover between uh, these groups. Indigenous Australians, unemployed people, single parent households, low income households, rental households, and young people. There's three components to food security. There's, uh, first is access, and that refers to individuals' ability to access food in their community. So if you live next door to a supermarket that can't afford food, you don't have food security. Um, if, uh, sorry, availability refers to whether the community has access to fresh food, and there are issues with that in remote parts of Australia. 
and use actually refers to knowledge about food and uh, its nutritional values. So that's related to education and affects some people who have migrated here and have lost access to the types of food they usually eat and are struggling to find a, um, uh, an alternative that provides them with uh, the best nutrition. So food insecurity for people without paid work is directly related to low welfare payments relative to the cost of living. And one way to improve those individuals through security is simply to raise a new start. I never said tonight would not be political, right? One way to ensure that communities here and overseas have a reliable availability within their communities to food is to ensure stable and plentiful production. But feeding everyone on Earth involves moving, aiming for a moving target because the population of the Earth is growing, as we've heard. But it is expected to stabilise at 11 million people. So um, that's, I guess that's the good news. That's a 50% increase in population from today. So logically, you'd say, well, we've got to increase our food production by 50%. But actually, uh, experts say we need to double our food production from today because so many people around the world are actually chronically undernourished. When we look at yields per um, area <coughs> for four cereal crops, maize, rice, wheat and soybeans, the good news is that they have been steadily increasing over the past decades. The solid lines on this graph show projections for if we stick to business as usual. And the good news is that our, um, our crop yields are expected to increase, but the bad news is um, they're not expected to increase fast enough to feed the growing population. Um, the utility lines are where we need to be um, and the solid lines are where we are expected to be at if we don't change something about the way we grow food. So what can we do to increase those yields that we aren't already doing? We've already made great genetic improvements to crops, um, initially through selective breeding and then through exposing seeds to radiation to cause random mutations and just see what the plants are like. Do they grow faster? Uh, and now we do that through genetic mut modification in a direct way. And that's what we mean when we say GMOs, uh, genetically modified organisms. Fes uh, fertilizers and pesticides are also being used to their logical conclusion. So um, genetic improvements, fertilizer use and pesticides are all being sort of fully maximized, um, fully utilized. So now we, we wouldn't say that they're increasing the yield, they're really just overcoming constraints in production. Um, so most crops are already growing at full tilt, if you will. At the same time, farmland's competing with land on which people need to live. And in most of the world, climate change will constrain food production. Rising temperatures hits not just our agricultural industry, but fishing industries. And we've got water scarcity, more frequent and more violent storms and migration of pests to higher latitudes. So all of these are putting pressure on producers uh, and making it harder for us to hit that target of doubling food production. So what we need is a fourth agricultural revolution. There have been times in human history where we've made great leaps in food production. And uh, this is quite a northern hemisphere centric view, but um, the first of the agricultural revolutions was the widespread cultivation of grain across the Northern Hemisphere um, about 10,000 years ago. The second agricultural revolution, based in Britain around the 1800s, um, and that um, led to the first sorts of genetic modification um, that we started doing with um, selective breeding of plants. This is around the time Gregor Mendel was crossing the uh, red and white pea plants, you know, the pundit squares that you might have done in your uh, high school genetics classes. Um, and the third agricultural revolution was based in the Americas and was based on, um, I think it's sort of got a domination of nature idea around it. It's fertilizer, it's irrigation, it's mechanization to grow more plants than before and grow them in areas where we previously had it. The fourth agricultural revolution, uh, I can't go much into it because it hasn't happened yet, but it has to happen. Um, and it'll involve changing the plants that we grow and radically changing the ways that we farm. And that will be brought about by a radical commitment to funding agricultural research. Um, so some of the things that might make up the Fourth agricultural revolution are uh, some more uh, GM technology. So uh, gene modification could potentially speed up plant breeding, 
uh, reducing the time between generations by one fifth. Um, we can enhance drought resistance and disease resistance of crops. Um, and I just want to point out here the Science Party does support um, GMO legislation, which is currently to allow the release of GMOs from the lab into the environment after stringent testing. But I would love all of your feedback if you have any on ways that we can proactively regulate new technologies like this. We can reduce food waste. Affluent countries in particular waste a lot of food um, that's partly uh, the user and it's also partly improving the supply chain from farm to table. We can promote acceptance of meat alternatives. I haven't talked about livestock versus crops, but um, livestock, it just does. Takes more land, takes more water, while producing more greenhouse gases per gram of protein produced. Um, because farmed animals usually eat some farmed grain as, uh, as well as, um, uh, even if they're grass fed, often they eat some um, grain to, to finish, finish them. Um, so we can look at alternative protein sources from insects, fungus, plant-based, um, and those are more easily controlled than livestock and minimise some of the ethical issues surrounding them as well as environmental ones. Um, automation, that first meant the ox straw and plough, um, and then it meant the combine harvester. And now it means using satellite data to diagnose deficiencies in soil and having drones spot spray for weeds so you can reduce your amount of herbicide. Um, farmers are all over this. Farmers are also all over improving their agricultural methods. Um, on this continent, we might just have to consider widespread cultivation of the drought-resistant plants and, and animals that have um, evolved here in desert conditions. You know, it's, it's not rocket science, unlike the, the last talk. Using regenerative agriculture to change farms into carbon sinks, actively helping to reduce the climate change damage that is affecting their industry um, and at the same time considering the soil microbiome and the, uh, the nitrogen cycle and the carbon cycle to make sure that the plants that we're growing at a faster rate aren't becoming, uh, ooh, aren't becoming nutrient deficient because they're growing too fast to take up the nutrients uh, that they previously have. So if we wind up with twice the mass of crops, but those crops are nutrient deficient, then we will have failed in our aim to feed the world. But overall, I don't think we will fail. Food security, as I said, is essential to a stable and prosperous society. Farmers are ahead of the game, but I think governments are lagging a little bit. Two things we need to do better in Australia are protect our water supply and fund more research. Maybe the Australian government will do that a little bit better when it, the situation becomes a bit more dire, but I believe they eventually will, and we will feed those 11 billion people. Thank you. Authorised by S. Manicum for the Science Party and more.